So now let's return to 15th century Italy and talk about the early Italian Renaissance. Again, Italy during this time was experiencing population growth, increased urbanization, trade, and wealth, all of which led to an increase in artistic patronage and higher levels of self-confidence, individuality, and innovation amongst artists. Italian humanists in the 14th century had emphasized the power and potential of human achievement, and they looked back over the last 1,000 years since the fall of the Western Roman Empire, and they felt that the achievements of the classical world had been followed by a dark age that only their era had begun to emerge from. They looked to the classical past for inspiration and instruction, and in Italy, this largely centered on the heritage of ancient Rome. Artists studied and sought to emulate Roman sculpture and architecture, usually with Christian subjects, themes, or for Christian use. The competitive atmosphere of Florence that spurred trade and commercial activity also spurred artistic competition. In 1401, the wealthy wool merchants guild sponsored a competition for the commission of a new set of doors for the Florence Baptistry. They wanted bronze gilded doors with scenes set in quatrefoil frames to match those made by Pisano in the 1330s. The project would be awarded to the contestant who showed the greatest talent and skill in a bronze competition panel depicting Abraham's sacrifice of his son, Isaac. Two competition panels survive today, presumably from the two finalists in the competition, Filippo Brunelleschi and Lorenzo Ghiberti, both young artists in their 20s at the time. Brunelleschi's composition, which is on the left here, shows Abraham lunging towards Isaac um, as the angel above them kind of swoops in and grabs Abraham's arm. Um, Isaac seems to be scrawny and afraid, while Abraham seems to be somewhat out of control and chaotic. And we have this rugged sort of explosive scene that really implies the sense of chaos within the struggle. And Brunelleschi has really focused on the drama and the intense emotions of the figures. Now, Ghiberti's composition, on the other hand, shows a much calmer Abraham who is poised to strike Isaac, who is a much more muscular, classically idealized figure. He is bound so that his body sort of creates this graceful curve or arc, and then the angel simply hovers above them gracefully. Now this scene is much more controlled. The graceful figures exhibit sort of calm, choreographed gestures and movements, and Ghiberti has really sought to balance the violence with a sense of classical restraint and poise. Ultimately, Ghiberti was awarded the commission, likely because he was the more experienced bronze caster and his design was more economical. He worked for 22 years to create 28 gilded bronze panels that featured New Testament scenes and images from Christ's life and passion, all within quatrefoil frames. Here are a couple of those panels as examples. So we have Christ's flagellation on the left in which Christ has been bound um, to a column and whipped by his captors. And then on the right, we have an annunciation scene in which the angel Gabriel swoops in to tell Mary that she will bear the son of God. Um, and then from above, we have um, either an angel or perhaps God the Father himself releasing the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove. Ghiberti's doors were so well received that he was then commissioned to make a second set for the Florence Baptistry. Years later, when Michelangelo saw these, he said that they were beautiful enough to be the gates of paradise themselves. So we typically refer to these as Ghiberti's gates of paradise. Now this new set features Old Testament iconography from the creation through the fall of man, Abraham's sacrifice of Isaac, and the story of Isaac's sons. So we'll look more closely at the Jacob and Esau panel, which depicts the story of Isaac's sons in a continuous narrative, which means that we have one visually cohesive scene that depicts several moments of a narrative together, although they're not necessarily shown in chronological order. So, according to the story, Isaac, the son of Abraham, grows up and marries Rebekah, 
and they have twin sons. Esau, the older twin, whose body is covered in hair, and Jacob, the younger twin, whose skin is smooth. Now Esau grows up and becomes a fierce hunter, and he is Isaac's favorite. And being the eldest, he's the one who will receive the birthright blessing, or the inheritance, essentially, when Isaac dies. Rebecca, however, favors Jacob because while she was pregnant, she received a vision from God in which he told her, Two nations are in thy womb, and two manners of people, and the one people shall be stronger than the other, and the elder shall serve the younger. Although I also think, according to the story, um, Rebecca didn't really like Esau's choice of wives either. But anyway, one day Esau comes home from work, exhausted and starving. Jacob is cooking stew and he sees his brother's weakness and he offers to give him a bowl of the stew in exchange for his birthright blessing. Now Esau is tired and hungry and he doesn't care very much at the moment, so he agrees. Later, when Isaac is old and blind and basically on his deathbed, he calls Esau to him and tells him to go hunting and to bring him some meat, and that when he returns, he will give him his birthright blessing. Rebekah overhears this and schemes with Jacob, telling him to go slaughter a goat and to bring Isaac the meat while using the goat's skin to disguise himself. So Jacob does this, and when he goes to Isaac, Isaac is suspicious at first, but he reaches out and feels the hairy goat's skin and assumes that this is Esau returning. Um, and so he bestows the birthright blessing upon the wrong son. So all of this is happening in a single scene, which makes for a pretty complex composition. However, uh, Ghiberti has managed to create a sort of harmonious and unified scene as well. Um, so the first part of the story occurs up here in the right corner where a pregnant Rebecca receives her vision from God. Um, then the second part of the story occurs down here, sort of in the middle uh, ground, kind of within this very classically styled architectural space with these tall kind of uh, rounded arches and these Corinthian pilasters. Um, but here we have Rebecca giving birth to her sons. Um, scene three is the moment that Jacob convinces a seated Esau here um, to, or rather tells him that he will give him a bowl of stew in exchange for his birthright blessing. Um, then here, scene four in the foreground, we have an older Isaac who tells Esau to go out hunting and to bring him back some meat so that he can give him his birthright blessing. Um, and then these are his dogs kind of here ready to go on the hunt with him scene five here in the background again we have esau going hunting kind of out into the wilderness um and then scene six we have in the middle ground again rebecca and jacob kind of scheming together about how they are going to trick uh, isaac and then here scene seven is the culmination um we have Isaac kneeling before his father, or excuse me, Jacob kneeling before his father Isaac, pretending to be his brother Esau, Rebecca standing kind of to the side and watching the exchange. Um, and so Isaac bestows the birthright blessing onto the wrong son, onto Jacob instead of Esau. Um, so again, quite complex. There's a, there's a lot going on here, yet he's managed to unify all of these individual scenes into one cohesive whole. Um, and we've done away now with the quatrefoil frame, and instead we have this believable pictorial space for these naturalistic figures to occupy. So architecture in early Renaissance Italy was also based on the theories and practices of classical Rome. Um, the classical Roman engineer and architect Vitruvius argued that architecture should be a combination of structural strength, utility or function, and beauty. Um, so early Renaissance Italian architects journeyed to Rome to study ancient buildings and ruins, particularly the Colosseum and the Pantheon, which we have here. Classical orders and architectural elements such as columns, pilasters, pediments, entablatures, arches, and domes really form the vocabulary of Renaissance structures. We'll also see an emphasis on symmetry and balance, proportion, and mathematical or geometric precision. 
So here we're looking at the Church of San Andrea in Mantua, Italy. It was designed by Leon Battista Alberti, an architect who aspired to recreate the glory of ancient times through architecture. Alberti believed that universal beauty could be achieved through mathematical proportions, just as the ancient Greeks did, although he rejected Greek-styled columns in favor of massive pillars and vaults from the Roman Empire. Now, on the exterior of the church here, we have a really strong sense of vertical rhythm created by the repeating Corinthian pilasters. Um, so these are the sort of flat, engaged, decorative, and square kind of columns with this Corinthian style capital. Um, we also see a strong sort of triangular pediment that sits above this rounded arched um, entryway. And again, we have sort of repetition happening with the smaller rounded arches of the niches and the windows um, across the facade here. The Church of San Andrea was derived from the classical Roman Basilica. The term basilica refers to the function of these buildings as meeting halls. Um, in ancient Rome, they were used for public meetings, legal matters, and business transactions, but they were later adopted by the Christian church. So a basilica is a longitudinal building with a wide central aisle called a nave, and then smaller side aisles that are often divided into chapels. Um, then it also has a semicircular recessed area at one end called an apse that's generally reserved for someone or something important. Um, typically, the basilica will also feature a perpendicular hall called a transept that crosses in front of the apse and gives the plan of the building a T or a cross shape. The intersection of the transept and the nave is called the crossing, and it's often covered with a dome. So here we are just inside the church, looking down this sort of heavy vaulted nave towards the apse. You can see natural light entering through the dome over the crossing. Alberti has incorporated those Corinthian pilasters um, that we saw on the exterior into the nave arcade as well. Um, now an arcade is simply a series of arches that sort of form a long wall or uh, create kind of like a hallway like space like this. Um, you might notice that again we have that focus on geometry and precision. You can see the repetition of squares and rectangles, circles, and those um, sort of semicircle arches again. Notice too the recessed squares that appear here on the ceiling of the vault and um, of the side aisles as well. These are called coffers. Um, they're sort of recessed uh, niches that create an interesting visual pattern but also help to reduce the weight of the stone ceiling. Um, this is something that Alberti has lifted straight from classical Roman architecture. In fact, if you click back a few slides, you can see a coffered ceiling inside the Roman pantheon. So the defining architectural project of the early 15th century was the completion of the Florence Cathedral. Construction of the cathedral began in the late 13th century and had continued intermittently through the 14th century. The drum and the dome of the cathedral were inspired by the Roman pantheon, but builders at the time lacked the engineering abilities to span the 140-foot diameter. Usually, they would have built a wooden scaffolding and centering to support the dome as it was being constructed, but the distance was just too large. The ancient Romans had relied on the sheer bulk of the Pantheon's nearly 20-foot thick concrete walls to support its dome, but by this point, that concrete recipe had been lost to time. So in 1407, when interest in the project renewed, it was the young Filippo Brunelleschi who solved the problem. He was initially trained as a goldsmith, but Brunelleschi traveled to Rome with his friend Donatello after failing to get the commission for the Florence Baptistry doors. Now upon his return, he proposed his solution for the cathedral's dome. Instead of a wooden scaffolding and centering, he would create a lightweight, double-shelled masonry dome using temporary wooden supports that cantilevered out from the exterior of the drum. He built the dome up in courses or layers so that each portion would support the next. 
He used vertical marble ribs, sandstone rings, iron rods, and oak beams to provide the interior support. And he connected the inner and outer shells through a series of um, internal arches. Now this created um, an interesting interior self buttressing unit that really required no external supports. The masonry on the exterior was then laid in a sort of herringbone pattern that locked it into place. And the pointed design of the dome allowed it to stand taller and to cover the pre-existing octagonal drum of the church crossing. And the pointed style also matches the older Gothic elements of the cathedral as well. The new architectural language inspired by ancient classical forms was accompanied by a similar impulse in sculpture. Donatello was among the most important of these first generation Italian Renaissance sculptors. He simultaneously looked back towards antiquity and towards the future by emphasizing his own individual creativity and potential. He approached each of his new commissions as an opportunity for a new experiment, and he manages to incorporate a sort of powerful sense of expression in his works. This particular sculpture of St. Mark was commissioned by the Linen Weavers Guild of Florence to fill one of the ground floor niches that decorated the exterior of Orson Michel, a newly completed loggia which served as a grain market. St. Mark here stands on a small pillow with his gospel book tucked under one arm, and he stares intensely off into the distance. Um, take a second to note the minute details that are included in the face and kind of the long curling beard there. Now, earlier Gothic sculptors relied on surface observations to create their works, meaning they depicted the face, clothing, and limbs as seen from the exterior, so often the body was lost beneath the drapery of the clothing. Donatello, however, thought of the body as a framework for the fabric, and therefore thought that it must be considered first. He would build full-scale models of nude figures using clay and then drape them with strips of clay-soaked linen to create garments. He could then arrange the folds of fabric to his liking before they dried and then copy the entire figure over into marble. Additionally, classical artists observed that human bodies are constantly in motion and changing. They conceived the contrapposto stance as a way to capture that sense of motion and create a sense of naturalism, while also creating harmony through counterbalance. A contrapposto stance shows the figure perfectly balanced with the whole of their weight supported by one straightened, tensed leg. The relaxed leg is generally bent at the knee, which produces a pronounced tilt at the hip line to accommodate that distribution of weight. And this creates a sort of soft S curve in the posture. The pattern of tension and relaxation is reversed in the arms. All of this results in a more naturalistic pose and creates a sense of lifelike motion within the figure. Donatello has incorporated this contrapposto stance here. St. Mark stands with his weight on his right leg and his left leg relaxed and bent at the knee, creating the S-curved posture. The left arm is engaged, holding the gospel book, while the right is relaxed at his side. And notice how the drapery of the clothing really responds to the stance of the body underneath. Here we have Donatello's Bronze David, which is perhaps his most famous work. This, of course, references the narrative of David, an Israelite shepherd boy whose brothers were serving in the Israelite army battling the Philistines. Goliath, a giant of a man uh, in the Philistine army, issued a challenge, and David, in his desires to prove himself, accepted the challenge, and then ultimately defeated the Goliath using a slingshot and a rock. Now, at the time, this was a popular story in Florence. The city really championed having morals and intellect uh, be greater than brute strength and physicality, and they saw themselves, in comparison with their rivals, as militaristic underdogs with a cultural superiority. So Donatello presents David here as a prepubescent young boy who is soft and fleshy rather than chiseled and heroic. 
This was made through the lost wax casting process, which was quite innovative at the time and really helped to enhance the sensual surface texture with this lustrous, smooth finish. Donatello has positioned David in the classical contrapposto stance, but the S curve is exaggerated because one foot is raised and propped up on the severed head of Goliath. Um, so this is the moment just after his victory, David has defeated Goliath with the slingshot, and then he has beheaded him with um, this sword. And now he strikes this confident, somewhat sassy pose. Aside from his hat with the laurel leaves adorning it, which laurel leaves symbolize victory and perseverance, um, David is completely nude. This work is actually the first life-size freestanding nude since antiquity. Now, during the medieval period, the physical body was believed to be the path to corruption. Therefore, nudity was deemed sinful. However, in antiquity, and then again in the early Renaissance, the study of anatomy increased and the nude body was often considered God's noblest creation. In fact, Michelangelo allegedly once said, who is so barbarous as not to understand that the foot of a man is nobler than his shoe and his skin nobler than that of the sheep with which he is clothed. The philosopher Plato also once argued that a person's physical beauty can inspire the viewer to think about divine love. So David's nudity here is certainly drawing on the classical tradition of heroic nudity and also the Neoplatonic idea that um, nudity can be a manifestation of God's divine love. David's angular pose and boyish figure, however, have long been criticized as feminine, and many scholars have tried to argue that that was simply a way of communicating that David was caught between childhood interests and adult responsibilities, and therefore he makes for a rather unlikely hero. There is also a certain level of eroticism here, though, that scholars tend to struggle with. Notice how this feather from the top of the helmet on Goliath's severed head trails up the inner thigh of our young hero, David. Some scholars really stress this overt sense of homoeroticism here. Um, and while we don't have any concrete evidence, it's been strongly suggested that Donatello was a gay man. Florence at the time did have a reputation of being rather accepting, so maybe this was his way of celebrating his own identity or the queer culture within the city. Or maybe Donatello was simply experimenting and intentionally trying to push the boundaries with his audiences. And through this provocative pose and nudity, maybe he's doing that. Um, he was able to be quite experimental and rather controversial at times because he could rely on the support of his patrons, the very wealthy Medici family. So like Flemish artists, Italian painters of the 15th century focused on creating believable illusions of reality. However, they did so in a more analytical way than the Northern artists. Instead of trying to describe the visual appearance of nature through luminous color and detailed textural differentiation, Italian artists aimed at achieving lifelike but idealized weighty figures set within a space organized through strict adherence to linear perspective. Artists had long noted that objects seem smaller as they get further away, and that parallel lines seem to converge as they recede into space. However, it wasn't about excuse me, it wasn't until about 1420, when while doing his studies of the Florence Cathedral, that artist and architect Filippo Brunelleschi discovered a mathematical system that gave the illusion of a measured and continuously receding three-dimensional space on a two-dimensional plane. Later, Leon Battista Alberti codified this system in his 1436 treaty Della Pittura, or On Painting. Now, a work from a bit later in the century, from about 1480, by the artist Perugino, um, titled Christ Giving the Keys to St. Peter, provides a really nice example of Alberti's one-point linear perspective system. Essentially, the picture surface is conceived as a flat plane that intersects with the viewer's field of vision at right angles. The viewer is based on the idea, or excuse me, this viewpoint is based on the idea that the viewer is standing dead center at a prescribed distance from the artwork. 
everything in the image would then appear to recede into the distance at the same rate, following imaginary lines called orthogonal lines that meet at a single vanishing point on the horizon. Using orthogonal lines and the controlled um, decrease of scale as forms move back towards the vanishing point, artists can replicate the optical illusion that things appear to become smaller, rise higher, and become closer together as they get further away from us. So again, Perugino's painting provides a very nice example of this one-point linear perspective system. Um, his composition is divided into three clear planes. We have the foreground, the middle ground, and then the background. Um, and so he's depicted this idealized sort of fictitious city with a large classical temple or church in the center of this big open piazza. And then we have sort of classical Roman triumphal arches flanking either side. In the foreground, we have Christ handing the keys of the church over to Peter. Um, so after Christ's crucifixion and resurrection, Peter takes over as the leader of the church and essentially becomes the first pope. Um, the exchange of the keys of the church is meant to symbolize this sort of transfer of authority and leadership. Um, now the poses of the figures in the crowd on either side of Christ and Peter um, are meant to sort of mirror each other, and then the colors of their clothing complement one another, all to create a sense of un unity, excuse me, harmony and balance. Um, the imagined orthogonal lines that lead back to the vanishing point, uh, kind of at the center within the church here, um, these have been illustrated for us in the grid-like tiles of the piazza. Um, and notice too that the figures sort of decrease in size as they get further away and all of the objects in the composition remain in scale. Um, Perugino has also incorporated what's called atmospheric perspective. He creates the illusion of depth by painting more distant objects with less clarity and with color um, excuse me, cooler colors to mimic the haze of the atmosphere that sort of appears between the viewer and faraway objects. So going back in time here just a bit, Masaccio was actually an early proponent of one-point linear perspective, and he really established a new direction in Florentine painting in the early 15th century by integrating these monumental and consistently scaled figures into rational, architectural, and natural settings using linear perspective. So here we're looking at one of his most famous works. This is Trinity, a fresco in the church of Santa Maria Novella in Florence, painted around 1426. So here Masaccio has really considered the position of the viewer in finding his vanishing point, and he situated it so that it's um, roughly at eye level for an average height viewer. Um, the resulting illusion is that the viewer stands sort of looking up into this real barrel vaulted niche in the wall that contains a funerary monument and has sort of an altar table or this open tomb along the wall in front of it. Now, within the illusionistic vault, we have these weighty, voluminous figures that progress backwards through space. So near the back of the niche, we have uh, the Holy Trinity uh, arranged in this nice, stable, triangular composition. Um, Christ hangs on the cross, and we can really tell that Masaccio has studied the anatomy of the body. Um, he depicts Christ as if gravity is sort of being enacted upon him, sort of forcing his body downward. Um, then behind Christ, we have God the Father standing, and then between their heads, kind of floating right above Christ's head, just below God's chin, we have um, this white dove, which is uh, representative of the Holy Spirit. Um, so then slightly closer to us, sort of just in front of Christ on the cross, we have uh, the Virgin Mary and St. John, John the Baptist. Mary is sort of gesturing towards Christ on the cross as if to say, look at what has happened to my son. Um, and then even closer to us, we have the donors, 
um, again, sort of featured on the outskirts of the scene, kneeling as if in prayer, um, but also here to sort of witness the events of the scene within the niche. Now below them, along the wall, in what would be the entablature of this niche, um, we have this altar table, or maybe it's meant to be an open tomb, kind of revealing a skeleton here. Um, above the skeleton, we have an inscription that states, As I am now, so you shall be. As you are now, so once I was. Um, so this portion is meant to sort of point out the inevitability of death and paired with the scene above, the idea is sort of reemphasized. Christ even, um, you know, even in all his holiness and his power could not escape death. So we as human beings should not expect to either. However, Christ rose again and through him we can be reborn as well. Um, also notice that even all of this illusionistic architecture um, that has been done in um, a very sort of classical Renaissance style. We've got that coffered barrel vault uh, that creates our niche and we've got both Ionic and Corinthian columns being incorporated into the niche. We have Corinthian pillars on the exterior here and then the entablature across the bottom. So Masaccio's short career culminated with a set of frescoes painted on the walls of the Brancacci Chapel in the Church of Santa Maria del Carmine in Florence. Um, the two most well-known scenes here are the expulsion of Adam and Eve from paradise and the tribute money. Um, so here in expulsion, Adam and Eve have already sinned by eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge and they're being banished now from the Garden of Eden. Now this is a fresco, so Masaccio would have used the Bon fresco technique. Um, he would have applied his pigment water solution to wet plaster. Um, now because the plaster dries quickly, these artists would generally only apply as much plaster to the wall as they knew for certain they could finish painting within a single day. So these sections are called giornata, after the Italian word for day, indicating that one section is one day's work. Um, so here you can see four giornata, or four sections, um, implying that this was about four days of work. Masaccio, we believe, completed the angel um, on the first day, the portal on the second day, Adam on the third day, and then Eve on the fourth day. Now, at the time of its creation, um, and at the time it was finished, the lines between sections would not have been visible, but as the paint and the color has sort of faded over time, they have become more evident. Now, notice too, the angel above that is sort of escorting Adam and Eve out of the portal and out of the garden. Um, so for a pictorial space to be consistent, the logic of linear perspective really needs to apply not only to the to the space, but to the objects within the space, everything that is receding into the distance, including organic shapes such as human bodies. Um, so this is called foreshortening. Um, so here Masaccio has foreshortened the angel to really give us the idea that he's kind of flying um, directly out of the picture plane towards the viewer. His body sort of recedes downward along those imagined orthogonal lines towards the horizon, implying that the lower body is further away than the torso and the head. Um, also, I would like to point out that the sword that the angel holds, as well as these rays of light that emanate outward from this portal um, from the garden there, these were once um, metallic silver, but they have oxidized over time, and so now they look black. Now the monumental nudes of Adam and Eve here make for a great figure study. Um, the fresco as a whole is about seven feet tall, so the figures themselves would be roughly about life size. Um, notice how Masaccio has really focused on the mass of the bodies. They are idealized figures, but they are also very naturalistic. He's really used this sort of subtle gradation of values um, of light and shadow to sort of model the figures and create a sense of volume and three-dimensionality. He also really gives 
um, attention to the underlying anatomy of the physical forms. You can sort of tell that he's studied skeletal and muscular structures. Um, and then he's really tried to situate these naturalistic figures within this illusionistic space by including a consistent light source from the right and then including the shadows that their very solid forms cast across the landscape. Um, he's also really demonstrated a high level of humanism here. He sort of emphasized the emotional impact of their newfound shame here. Adam is sort of burying his face in his hands, and then Eve is sort of wailing in agony and trying to cover her body. The consequences of their sinful actions have really begun to take hold as they're being cast out of the Garden of Eden here. Masaccio's Tribute Money portrays a scene from the life of Christ that highlights St. Peter, who is the patron saint of the Brancacci Chapel. So this is another continuous narrative. So we have multiple moments from the same story presented in one unified scene. So in the center, we have a tax collector who we see from behind. He's wearing this sort of short red Roman style robe. Um, he arrives and tells uh, Peter, that Jesus needs to pay the Jewish temple tax or the tribute money. Um, so we have these rather dynamic diagonals within the postures of the three main figures here that really convey this sense of tension within the confrontation. Um, so Jesus, he tells Peter to go over to the sea and drop a hook and pull up the first fish that he catches. So over here in the scene to the left and kind of further away in the background, um, which we can tell because the crouching Peter here is sort of smaller in scale, right? Um, Peter does this and he pulls up a fish and inside the fish's mouth, he finds enough coin to pay the tax collector double, which he can be seen doing in the scene over here to the right. Um, now this story was especially poignant for Florentines at the time because in 1427 the city had implemented a new personal property tax to fund military defense and a lot of citizens were upset about it. Now this fresco is noted for its early use of both linear and atmospheric perspective to integrate figures, architecture, and landscape into a single unified whole. We have bold highlights and shadows that create a consistent light source and help with the modeling of these voluminous figures. And also, instead of treating the halos like flat golden discs behind the heads, he's foreshortened them accordingly to sort of suggest that they float and move uh, within, or excuse me, they move with the figures that they're attached to. Now, the vanishing point of the scene appears just sort of above and behind Christ's head here. So everything in the scene seems to converge towards him, making him the visual and symbolic center of the composition. Masaccio has used a linear perspective in um, the architecture here, and then he's reinforced that by decreasing the scale of the trees in the distance, and again, of Peter kind of crouching to the left here. Now, Masaccio also incorporates a subtle use of color to create atmospheric perspective within the distance. The mountains fade from sort of grayish green to this sort of grayish white in the distance. And then the houses and trees along the slopes here are rendered with sort of loose, sketchy lines to mimic the lack of clear definition when viewing things in the distance through haze. Um, he also employed a wide range of hues and values and a rather sophisticated shading technique that involved an early form of color theory. Um, so for example, the green robe over here on this figure was actually shaded with red, um, which is the color complement of green. 
And here we have yet another artist um, who was quite prominent during the 15th century Italian Renaissance. This is Sandro Botticelli. And so like most artists in the second half of the 15th century, Botticelli painted rather sculptural figures that were modeled by light from a consistent source and they were placed within a believable space rendered using linear perspective. Now Botticelli worked in Florence, often for the Medici family, before moving to Rome to work on the Sistine Chapel in the 1480s. Afterward, he returned to Florence and entered a new phase of his career in which he produced secular paintings of mythological subjects inspired by ancient works. His most famous work is The Birth of Venus, which he created from 1484 to 86, and it depicts the Neoplatonic idea of divine love in the form of a beautiful nude figure. Botticelli has based his beautiful nude figure off the classical goddess of love and beauty, Venus. And in particular, he has modeled his Venus after an antique statue type called the Modest Venus, which was ultimately based on a sculpture by the artist Praxilates titled Aphrodite of Nidos. So in Botticelli's Birth of Venus, um, Venus stands uh, on this scalloped seashell. Um, she's been born from the sea foam and now she's floating ashore on this seashell. And she sort of averts her eyes from the viewer's gaze and really carefully arranges her hands and her hair uh, to sort of hide her nudity. But this motion actually sort of draws more attention to her um, sexuality here. Now to the left we have the wind god Zephyrus and his lover the nymph Chloris, and then Botticelli's sort of decorative use of line illustrates that the wind that's blowing Venus to shore is coming from Zephyrus. To the right we have a female worshipper or maybe the goddess of spring sort of awaiting to welcome Venus and wrap her with this rather intricately embroidered uh, robe. Now the figures here are somewhat elongated and graceful, and they are a bit more stylized than those of the Saccio, not necessarily as naturalistic. Um, and we have maybe a greater attention uh, being given to the minute details, to the patterns, and to the decoration within the scene. Um, so Botticelli is certainly uh, kind of striving towards these Renaissance ideals, but I think he's also using a sort of medieval or gothic sense of stylization um, in these as well. It's also worth pointing out that um, this is temper paint rather than oil paint. Um, oil paint doesn't become as popular in Italy as it is in the north until um, really the high renaissance. So with tempera, we have kind of this, um, you know, this ability to give such attention to detail and create these very fine lines and kind of subtle, um, subtle details and things.